first speaker this evening. His name is Axel. Like I said, he truly is an excellent guy. You know, in life, you meet people who they just care. They just care. Like, they don't care about you. They don't care about their opinion. They don't care about their opinion. They just care about you. They just care about you. They're not doing it for any reason other than they just want to empower people. He genuinely cares, heart of gold, this young guy. And it's a real honour to have him speaking tonight. So, let me shut up <laughs> and let me introduce Axel Vanderbilt. <laughs> Are we working? Can everybody hear me live? Or Meshurunefa, that means good afternoon, that's the ancient language of the Egyptians. I like to study my ancestors, so they would say Meshurunefa, okay? They would say Uncle Jasaneb, that means life, prosperity, and health, and it's something which I wish each and every single one of you. Um, the first thing that I want to say, kind of before I even get too deep and kind of start babbling, kind of, I think that you should come very meaningful and say, thank you, Emperor Shan. You are phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You didn't quite hear me. I said, join me when I said, <laughs> thank you, Empress Shan. You are phenomenal. Thank you, Empress Shan. You are phenomenal. <laughs> Ultimately, I hope your hands are still live because I've got a few reasons that you're going to give yourselves a good time of applause. But before I say that, what I want to do is I know that for some people coming out to types of events like this is very new, it can be overwhelming. So I'd like you to turn to the same person who you just met and very simply introduce yourself and pay them a compliment. Don't be sleazy with it. <laughs> I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. <laughs> and go out and party from time to time, the world doesn't need more drunk people, it does need more self-aware, inquisitive people prepared to take constructive action. And I think the fact that you're here this evening is testament to that. So that's the first reason. The second reason is a little bit deeper. I teach history, okay? Not as a profession because technically I don't have the credentials, okay? But while I'm in schools or I'm in private sessions, one of the hardest things that I find doing is getting people to relate to the information. And it's probably because we're taught that history is nothing but the past, it's relevant and it has nothing to do with us. Now, I actually learned, completely contrary to this, um, that we are not only every single shred of history that's ever passed, but also responsible for making history today. Yes. Now, let me give, give you a bit of context for that. Each and every single person sitting in this room right here, right now, is built up of 50% of the best bits of their mother, and uh, built up of 50% of the best bits of their father. And it's the same for your mothers and fathers, and it's true for them, and it's true for them as far back as you care to stretch your mind. In fact, if you go back just 10 generations, which is 300 years, you will be built up of an average of 4,096 people, okay? So the fact that you're here today, sitting in this room, is no accident, okay? You're built up of what it takes genetically to survive in countless wars, conflicts, famines, poverty. Your more recent ancestors, okay, would have been responsible for innovations and changes which changed the face of society on the local and the worldwide level. Uh, your ancestors would have survived things like uh, the Cold War, the Depression, Great Depression, uh, the Civil Rights War, um, your more recent ancestors would have uh, made it through things like, um, well, we're currently living in the, you know, the war on drugs, the war on information. So the fact that you kind of beat the odds and you're here tonight deserves a massive round of applause. Yeah. First and foremost, um, I have a mentor, and one of the biggest, or one of the first lessons which my mentor kind of gave to me is that a man should be judged for um, the work that he does for his community. Uh, so quite rightly, like Chantal says, I like to think that I put myself in a state of service. Now my name is Axel, okay? I am 50% of what's called the USLI team, okay? USA stands for Your Universal Soul Abundance, and I just know bondness, because that's <laughs> maybe a little bit. Um, now, some people call me Blacktool, 
Okay, so people call me Omega, or people call me Minafa, or people call me Egypt from time to time. And ultimately, I'm going to be very honest with you, I'm quite a boring person. I'm probably the least excited person I should have been invited to come and speak to you guys, because I like to keep to myself, okay? I'm relatively socialish, I've got friends, but my idea of chilling and having a good time is I like to read, I like to study, I like to meditate, and to be honest, for as hippie as it sounds, I like to help people. Okay? So as I said, I'm part of the UCI like team, which is standing for your universal soul abundance. And our organization is centered around our 300 page guidebook, um, which is all about mastering the mind, the body, and the spirit. Um, it's sold 16,000 copies worldwide so far. Um, it's an Amazon bestseller. It's got accolades um, for, uh, again, bestselling, uh, for best selling. Um, but I guess the underlying function and purpose of USO and what we do is to help people realize that they can release themselves from the shackles of self-limitation. Okay, because ultimately I'm sure we all agree that you can only be your own understanding. Can I get a nice shake to that? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Um, I'm also 50% of the House of Qatar, which is an Afrocentric research show and tell team. Okay, we specialize in the ancient Egyptian and Nubian or Kushite history. Okay, we specialize in helping black African people of the diaspora reconnect to their ancestral roots because I'm sure you would agree, as black African people, we have been stripped away from our history. Mm -hmm. And as a great leader within the black community, said Marcus Garvey, a people with no knowledge of history and culture mm -hmm. is that the truth. Mm -hmm. Can I get an action? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my Kill King, my co scholar, my co my family member, BC, the boss man. We've been going into schools for the last 12 months teaching the use of our African excellence. As I said, we specialize in Egyptian and Kushite history. Um, and we also do a black excellence tour at the British Museum, which has been very fantastic for the last um, six or seven months. Now, also part of the Soul and 50% of the Soul Fan, which is a like minded conscious community link event where people from all over the UK, actually all across the board, for people like from America, Paris, and other places to basically just come together in a room and chill, okay? Share experiences, because what I found with events like this, it's fantastic. You're gonna come here, you're gonna listen to people speak and become empowered and be inspired, but you've all gotta go home at the end. You don't really have much time to link and kind of speak and communicate with each other. So, accommodation providers for the Soul Fan Speak, although you can come, food is provided, or watch the documentary up on the big screen, with whole conversations, and we found it to be very, very good. People have come together and started businesses together, they've become best friends, and even got abroad. So, that's the sofa. Okay, we've actually just um, organised our first international trip as well. And people get to go. What's great? Um, I'm also involved in various kind of other community projects which are on the rise at the moment, um, starting a Saturday school for people in the West Midlands over the next few months. Now, as I said, my mentor gave me um, our first lesson. He said, a man should be judged for the quality of the work that he does for his community. Now, I refer to myself as king. And it's not because I'm some lost African girl named Prince. Okay? I'm not, I've not changed my name by Depot, okay? I don't want to know it yet. I haven't got people to dictate to. But what I do have is a certain level of self-respect that allows me to dictate to other people how they treat me. Because I'm sure, I'm sure you will agree. When you treat yourself like something that belongs in the bin, other people are more likely to treat you like something that belongs in the bin. Can I get an arche to that? Now ultimately, okay, when I'm referring to myself as a king, as I said, that lets other people know you can't treat me in any other way which I deserve. But you'll notice that the key word is deserve, okay? I can't go around treating people like the then profess to call myself a king of really profess to love myself, because people who love themselves see reflections of themselves in every single person. Okay? So how can I treat people like that and say that I love myself? Okay? Because I'm supposed to be able to see myself in other people. Okay? Now What's that saying? They say, what does what Simon says about Sally says more about Simon than it does about Sally? Is that what you Okay. Now, self arrogance is at no point, uh, sorry, self love is at no point arrogant unless you are an arrogant person, very soon. Okay? But ultimately, nobody has the right to tell any other person how to live their life. Okay? So I'm not going to stand up in here uh, and tell you how you should live your life. There are, however, certain qualities that we find common amongst people that we consider to be beacons of life. And these are things which we should all be conscious of, not just us in this room, but every single person in the world should be conscious of. Now, I'm first, let's see if I can sit this way. Now, as a king or a queen, okay, the first thing that you need to, to kind of take note of is self love should be the foundation upon all else is built upon, okay? You have to consider yourself to be. In fact, there's a saying. They say that Rome wasn't built in a day. 
I'm not Roman, yeah, I'm African, okay? So I say that the pyramids were not built in the day, okay? You have to consider yourself to be the epitome of master craftsmanship, okay? You are the pyramid that you're building. And what you're finding is when you find that sweet internal spot, you're gonna shine the radiance the pyramids didn't get in front, okay? What you've got to take into consideration is that the pyramids weren't right first time, okay? It took more open attempts to get the science, the engineering, the maths, the astronomy right. And that's gonna be the same for you guys. You're gonna try and do, uh, try and do things, you're gonna try and strike out by yourself, try to grow and evolve, and it's gonna fail sometimes. But you've got to remember, a good king or queen is gonna learn valuable lessons from each and every single failure. I'll be very honest with you, my biggest failure ever, biggest financial failure ever, is something which created use of life, basically. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my biggest failure, so you have to kind of embrace that. Now, another thing. The mentor also told me that good fortune does not fall to the idol, okay? It falls to, oh sorry, good fortune doesn't fall to the idol. You can miss by an inch or a mile. It is your effort, worthiness, and energy which is viable, okay? So this kind of self-ordained status of loving yourself comes with the responsibility of realizing <coughs> that you are a creator in a creator's universe and that you have the ability to spot and create opportunities at your will, if you so be, okay? So, it also, it also depends on your on your dominant thoughts and habitual actions. Because if you, for example, want to be a millionaire, but you're not thinking like a millionaire and not acting like a millionaire, do you think you're going to become a millionaire? No. Precisely. Okay. Now, with self-love comes the realization, okay, that your body is the temple that all of the holy scriptures are talking about, okay, and that your health, lifestyle, and diet are intricately connected, okay. So the more kind of ex or internally aware you become, the more externally aware you become to how your actions take effect on other people and put everything around you, okay? Now, the more you become in tune with yourself, you start to think about how you feel your body, and you start to realize two things. It's much harder talking in front of people. I like being kind of huge people. <laughs> and I like having things to point at you, so that means you are bored with my presentation. But, um, yeah, like I said, you begin to realize two things. The first is that the food industry has become so far removed from the natural process. And the second is the more you choose to consume this food, the higher the statistics for chronic illness rise across the world, as they have continually to do for the last 50 years, okay? So, this is actually part of the result of the world's overconsumption of meat, okay? Including all meat, whether it's fish, high or low quality, genetically modified foods which are used in crop production, chemical additives, um, flavor rings, all of these different key numbers that you see on your packets, these are all responsible for the hyper chronic illness across the world. Okay? Now, there's one thing as well which is very important. For example, water. Okay? People are not aware that there's something called fluoride in the water. Who knows what fluoride is? Okay? So I say about half the people, half the people know. Fluoride, for those who don't know, is a metal compound which the Nazis use to keep their prisoners on board those hatch, and it's in our water supply. Okay? Now, there are, the medical effects on the body range, there's one sort of condition called fluoriosis, and it's chemical decay in the teeth. Um, fluoride in our water is known to cause um, brain tumors. Um, it um, aids arthritis and joint problems. It affects the blood cell production. And this is in our water, guys, so things like bottled water are a must, okay? So, with chronic illness on the rise, and the food industry is something which we can't trust, the levels of self-love that we have for ourselves demand that we take responsibility. We start looking for the answers because ultimately, <coughs> well, the truth is, we're living in a world where the medical industry has made a monopoly over the population's health. Okay, it's detrimental to have a healthy population because then they've got no cost now. Okay, it wasn't always like this. For example, the fundamentals of Chinese traditional healing: a doctor will be paid a retainer for every month that his client or his patients were healthy. When his patient was sick, he'd stop getting paid. Okay, he would not be paid again until his patient was healthy. The best Chinese doctors were the ones who would resort, or sorry, who did not resort to surgery. So the, the, the focus was on prevention, as opposed to surgery. But you skip fast forward here to the West, surgery is the main thing, and that's because the waste the most money, so that's it, you're going for surgery, okay? So, as I said, they're out here trying to make profit from it. So, if we can't trust the food industry, as I said, it is down to us to take responsibility. And as I said, there's nobody in the room has the right to tell you how to live your life. But the one thing I believe every single person has the right to tell any other person is whatever you do decide to do, in whichever way you do decide to live your life, ensure that you add value to other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Simple, very, very simple. 
Now, the last time that I was here, Chantal said something which she's mentioned again, put yourself in a state of service. And it's something that I didn't realize that when I become activated and kind of started on this journey that I was doing. But when I kind of analyzed and I realized that aside from my efforts and my determination, the reason that I've had so much success so far is because all my projects are for the benefit of other people. Mm -hmm. Like, I might get paid here and there, but every time like, I have people come back into me and they're saying, wow, for example, I've read the book and my life's completely changed. So it's little things like that that just literally blow me up inside. I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, but ultimately, most people that I know, or most people that I come into contact with who feel, who feel similar to me, find it to be the same. Okay? The more in alignment with themselves, the more natural that they find themselves, the more they want to give back. <coughs> I'm sure Chantal agrees. I'm sure there's people in here sitting amongst us right now that agree. The more you're kind of becoming more aware of yourself, the more you want to give other people. So, yeah. Yeah. I get an ass shit to death. <laughs> Now, ultimately, the more in tune and more aligned that you come with yourself, that doesn't mean that everybody wants to become a personal trainer or a personal coach or a lifestyle coach, okay? Because ultimately, each and every single one of us sitting in this room is an individual, okay? Every single person has transferable skills and has the ability to contribute to the great good. And it's the fact that you are all individuals that makes this possible. Because if everybody had the same recipe and they turn up to the cookout, everyone's eating the same food, okay? So it's all about our individualism that makes this work. Now, I know people, for example, one of the sisters, my good friend who was supposed to be with us today, she was, um, she makes jewelry. I call it joy jewelry, okay? Because the information and the symbols that she passes the tech people and it brings them smiles, it brings them joy, okay? I know people who make websites who bring people's ideas to life, okay? So magic, okay, can be so simple sometimes that we sometimes overlook the fact that we're doing magic. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. I get our shit to that. <laughs> <laughs> This next bit, I, kind of, I wanted to speed through this next bit because this next bit I wanted to kind of spend a bit more time on it because to be honest with you, I find it to be the most pertinent issue or one of the biggest things that we could kind of be speaking about. So, as I mentioned, this kind of journey that we're on forces you to look inside, uh, that, look, sorry, force, that looks inside forces you to look outside as well, okay? And it makes you think about what you give power to and what you don't give power to and kind of, like I said, how your actions affect other people. And I want to talk to you about the way in which women are treated, both historically and society and today, okay? I don't believe in sugarcoating information because as we just discussed, the world's health problems are bad enough without adding verbal diabetes to the list, okay? So as I said, women are oppressed and by default, men are the oppressors, okay? So we live in what's called a patriarchal society. Has anyone heard that before? Yeah. Anybody disagree? No. <laughs> um, now the evidence is available worldwide, okay? And although each and each of the individual issues are kind of very big topics which need to be tackled individually, we don't have time to go into them. And technically as a man, I'm not actually qualified to speak on behalf of women, okay? But I am qualified to speak on behalf of men who do need to be able to kind of put their ego to the side when dealing with this issue. Because really and truly, this kind of oppression of females is new to us on a cultural level, which we'll kind of discuss in a minute. I want to give you the definition of a patriarchal society after I've a drink. Hot in here. Everybody still nice? Yes. Everybody bliss? Yes. Can I get an ash shake for that? Yes. <laughs> right, then. So, the definition of a patriarchal society, very simply, is a system of governance or domination by which the white law can just be taken over and over everybody else. Okay, so again, at this point now, we all know what this is. Do we do this already? So the reality of it is, okay, this is reality. Okay, I know it sounds extreme when you first hear it, okay, but you know, when, when you compare today to say the Victorian ages when women were possession of men, or the Puritan ages where women were being burned at the stakes by Jews and Triple Swims, times have changed, okay? But what you've got to take into consideration, the symptoms of patriarchy evolved to stay current and relevant in the day in the current day and age. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So things just evolve. Um, so, I want to give you a little bit of context to this patriarchal society that we live in. In the UK, there are about 64 million people, 55% of which are female. Now, for every one woman, there are four men in Westminster, and women just um, represent 14% of the country's elected mayors and councilmen and women, uh, and only 22% of the positions in the House of Lords. Women in business only control 17% of the top 4,100 companies, and men are 
absolutely zero women in the Bank of England's monetary committee. Mm -hmm. um, women can expect to be present, uh, can expect to be paid on average 20% less than men in average earnings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but what else have we got? In the justice system, women do represent 51% of the staffing, but only 15% of the staffing in high court. Okay. So it's like, okay, you can work on that straight one of the big cases. Okay. Um, another one is <laughs> only 15% of the country's police and crime commissioners are women. Okay, so any, I don't want to go into too deep, but, but my favourite one is this one. 78% of newspaper articles which are written in the UK are written by men, only 5% of the women are actually edited. So men can have all of their opinions about anything, and only 5% of the women get to kind of filter out and Okay. Now I could literally go on for hours, okay? I'm sure you agree with me. Women are dominated by men every single time. Clear that shit. Okay, is that right? Should, should that be right? No. Now, patriarchy is infectious, okay? One of its characteristics alongside domination is competition. Now we're always using whatever platform we possibly can to prove how much better we are than somebody else. And one of the ways in which this kind of plays out in this patriarchal society is by the outrageously, ridiculously high beauty standards which are set by the media. Okay? Now what this does, other than create a demand for the cosmetic industry, it creates insecurities, it creates envy, it creates competition. And it means sometimes that I see sisters bitching at each other when you should be supporting each other. Can I get an shit to that? <laughs> so ultimately, Okay, man, as I explained, we have to be able to kind of put our ego down when we're dealing with this issue because it is new to us on a cultural level. Okay, the patriarchal system encourages um, men to see women as possessions and toys, and I'm sure you'll kind of agree if you watch TV. Mm. Um, and it means, oh, sorry, they project that women are nothing to nothing but objects to be kind of manipulated and catered. And it's successfully indoctrinated male by the time you should be a man is still a boy mentally and emotionally, okay? Now this very, oh, this same system, as I said, encourages us to use kind of women as, pop, as like an object, and it's created a hyper-sexualized kind of society which encourages men to see sex as a conquest and thus makes women part of the battle. Does that make sense? <laughs> now, ultimately, the reason that I kind of give so much context to this is because the way in which we do treat our women kind of societally, professionally, and personally is a new behavior, okay? It's new to us on a cultural level, okay? Now, I'll explain why. Anatomically speaking, which means you know, the way that your body is set up, each and every single person in this room began life as a female, okay? For the first five to six real, uh, weeks in the, in the womb, you're a female, you go until the SRY gene activated, okay? That's the reason why, as men, we have nipples with no function, and we have a penis, which is nothing but a penis, okay? So, technically speaking, if you want to be real about it, if you want to be real about it, men ain't nothing but mutated females, so sign up with the X-Men. The second reason is a little bit deeper. Like, I don't, I'm, not a bi I'm not a religious person, but not to be biblical with you, the definition of the word God in its simplest form is something that creates something. Now, am I right in saying the closest physical manifestation in this world is the woman? Can I get a shade to that? So ultimately, okay, when a woman is oppressed, so is her community, so is her nation. I don't quite know who said that. I know I didn't, I didn't write it, but I know exactly what it means, okay? Women are the bearers of the next generation. It is literally in their womb that the next generation comes from, okay? So if they're continually exposed to one up in them, to poor conditions, they're mistreated as we're misinformed about how to treat and how to fuel their body, that's gonna have a domino effect onto our children, is that right? Okay, now, let's take a breath, take a drink. <laughs> now, as I said, I teach history. Now, one of my great teachers, John Henry Clark, who's our ancestor now, rest in peace, um, he teaches us, okay, that history is not everything, but it is a start. Okay, it allows people to tell their cultural time of day. It not only tells people where they are, but it tells people where they should be. Okay? Now, I say that history is powerful because it allows us to see how things were and how things are now. Also allows us to look at how we are and how we were back then. Okay, so I want to share with you some examples that were left to us by arguably the most mysteriously advanced civilization that's ever recorded to exist. Okay? Now, the people of the current landmass that we call Egypt, okay, the indigenous people of ancient times, called it Kemet. Okay? Kemet stands for the black community. Okay? Now, in Kemet, 
we see the creation and formation of um, things such as the liberal arts, which are reading, writing, math, science, geometry, and all of these different ways of And with them being the builders of our pyramids, we know that they were just the artists in this world. So now we're not ready yet. <laughs> but, so, where are we at with these notes? So as if, as if that wasn't enough, all of you know, reading, writing, math, science, all of these wonderful things, it was our ancestors' connection and understanding to the divine laws in nature which kind of created the spiritual systems which we see carved up in the stones on all of the temples in, in Egypt today. Okay? Now, it is that blueprint that they created that we see the package and reserved to us in what we call modern day religion. Okay? Now, the reason that I mention this is not because I want to be in the call of you, because I understand the stigma around that, but the reason that I mention this is because we're able to look at how things work and how things are. Now, in ancient Kemet, okay, as I said, in their spiritual system, for every male deity, there was a female deity. So whenever we hear of Asar, the god of death and afterlife, we have Aset, the goddess of love and family and nurture. Okay? When we have um, Tefnut, we have Shu. Okay? So the point that I'm making is, there was always balance. Okay? For every male, there was a female. Okay? Um, the point that I want to make very quick, because I told you I can talk, is, is this. Our ancestors understood the importance of divine balance, okay? Now, I know that not every man, everyone might not be aware of Egypt like I am, but they were fantastic. They were creating things that we're unable to replicate today. They had an advanced system which we're unable to replicate today. And it was partly because they had this system in place to where people were able to, to have balance, okay? Women had equal rights, they were represented in government. And that balance was echoed and manifested throughout society to where things worked. So the point that I want to make very, very simply is mandem. We have to stop sending our sisters, we have to lift them up because ultimately they are the bearers of the next generation. If it is not for them, we're not going to get anywhere quicker. Right? So thank you for your time. Peace, peace, and love. Thank you for